So does the IMPP method fit in any way into the new terminology of neurodiversity? And the answer is yes. The reason being is that neurodiversity as a term describes the comorbidity that exists between so many different diagnoses. So for example, we know that up to 80% of children diagnosed with dyslexia share some symptoms in common with developmental coordination disorder or attention deficit disorder. So things like um, awkwardness, poor visual motor integration, um, organizational skills, uh, sequential learning, and so on. We know that attention deficit disorder um, can be a very wide-ranging um, diagnosis. You can have slight distractibility or you can have someone who is hopping from one subject to another and never seems to be able to stay its down task at all. All of these different diagnostic categories usually have within them some element of neuromotor immaturity. Difficulties with or problems with functioning of the vestibular system, visual functioning study I did in 2001 looking at dyslexia, we found that a hundred percent of children who had received a previous diagnosis of dyslexia given by an educational psychologist all had visual motor integration difficulties, hand-eye coordination difficulties that are going to undermine the ability to, to write and to express yourself in written form. So we know that some degree of neuromotor immaturity persists within these different categories, including the autistic spectrum disorders. If I go back more than 35 years when I first started to work in this field. If a family had contacted me and said, can we help, we, our child has had a diagnosis of autism, I would probably have said no. Because in those days, autism described a child who had virtually no verbal language or language skills. They had very little social reciprocity and they were often locked into stereotype behavior. So I can remember children who came and spent two hours while I talked to the parents, flicking a light switch on and off repetitively. And we, we had to start a program by observing behavior and what movements were actually used in those behaviors to decide the program that we would start on. So that's one end of the spectrum. Now that spectrum is so huge or vast that at the other end you have children who are a little bit quirky for want of a better term. It has been said that all of us have aspects of autistic behavior, autistic traits when we are under stress, when we are overloaded, but they should be so minimal that they don't enter into the question of needing a diagnosis. But many of those have the same underpinnings. So let me give you an example. One of the reflexes that is crucial to a program success is the Morrow reflex. This, as pa parents would recognize from when their children were very young, if there is a sudden loud noise, sudden change of light or temperature, or the baby is handled unexpectedly, the baby will <gasps> and then start crying. And that's perfectly normal. It's what it should do at that age because it's its only defense or fight flight mechanism because it doesn't have the muscle tone, the postural control or other things to look after itself. But somewhere around four months of age, that should start to be transformed into what's called a startle reflex. So something unexpected happens and the baby blinks raises its shoulders slightly, and then it starts to use its senses to search the environment and make a thinking decision. Do I need to react to that, or can I ignore it and carry on with what I was doing? If you still have a moral reflex, and it may be very specific as to which stimuli it still responds to, it kicks in first, you have the fight-flight reaction, the thinking brain comes in two or three seconds later and thinks, why did I do that? It wasn't anything to be really scared of. But because that moral reflex is associated with secreting the, um, the hormones into the system that are associated with fight and flight, everything about that situation feels as if it was life-threatening. So you have a conflict between what I know, what I can now see, and how I feel. And that child will tend to be hyper-reactive to certain stimuli, hyper-vigilant to similar situations where they think that might happen, because it's a horrible feeling. It tends to make them appear to be emotionally immature because they overreact to things that other children don't. And it tends to make them um, high, have heightened sensitivity to certain stimuli in the environment as well. Many of those things are traits, they're not autism, but there are, they are traits that are seen within autistic spectrum disorder. So our job is to look at that diagnosis again and say, right, that's really very interesting. It tells us what we've got, it tells us what everybody else has recognized. What we want to look at is what's 
What are the underlying mechanics? What is causing that child to behave like that in that particular environment? Is there a reflex there that explains it? Is there something we can do about it? In some cases there may not be, but in many there are, and that's where this fits into that sort of neurodiversity umbrella.